Well, in our final study, we come to the final ecclesia, Laodicea. And I think we all know what Laodicea stands for. There's no mention of Nicolaitans, no mention of Balaamites, no mention of the synagogue of Satan. Their enemy was apathy and indifference. And if ever there is an age, it's the age today that we live in, one of apathy and indifference. We find, in fact, that Laodicea was a very extensive city. In the last five years, actually, they've done significant archaeological excavations, and it is a massive city. It's even thought to be greater than Ephesus, which is saying something. And slowly, this site will be open to the public to see the extent of the wealth of this city. It was truly a monument to civilization. It lay on a very important crossroads in this area of Western Turkey, and uh, that made it extremely prosperous. If you have a city on a straight road, prosperous, but when you have crossroads and you fertilize through cross trade, the money starts to flow in, and this was no exception with Laodicea. In fact, it became an important banking center, and we know that banking centers in the world become financial hubs, and that was the Laodicean city itself. It was noted for its garments of black wool, and garments becomes a a question within this ecclesia itself. And also it was famous for the manufacture of collyrium, which was a a type of uh, eye salve. And of course we are aware, aren't we, of the exhortation the Lord gives in relation (coughs) to anointing the eyes. So so once again, the, the geography and the history lend some figure to the solution that the Lord has to this ecclesia. In relation to its founding, it was most likely founded by the labours of Paul, who spread the gospel in the surrounding regions, and taken up by faithful brethren. But I'd like you to come to Colossians chapter 4. You see, Laodicea appears in the epistle to the Colossians. And we're going to have some reference later on to this epistle in relation to this ecclesia. Uh, But here it is in Colossians chapter 4. Where in verse 15, Paul says this. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus and the Ecclesia which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the Ecclesia of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So quite clearly the letters like Ephesians and Colossians were circular letters, and they did the rounds. The seven ecclesias would have been involved in, in, in the rounds of those letters. And uh, the, whilst we have no record of the epistle from Laodicea, uh, some think, in fact, that the letter to the Ephesians formed part of the basis for that letter to the Laodiceans. And, and the letters are going to be paramount as we, we look at those, those uh, concepts. So you see, Laodicea was known. It was on the route There was Nymphus in the house ecclesia there, and and over the next 30 years that would expand into rather a large ecclesia in a very prosperous city. But in Revelation chapter 3, our Lord begins with a very clear note of authority. Verse 14, to the angel of the ecclesia, the later scenes write, These things saith the Amen. And amen in scripture means so be it, or or faithfulness actually in the Hebrew. And it's drawn from Isaiah 65. Let's just come across to Isaiah 65. And there's an appropriateness as we're going to see about this quotation. Isaiah 65. So here we have it in verse 16. Those that bless themselves will bless themselves in the earth, shall bless himself in the God of the Amen, the God of truth. Rotham translates that, the God of the Amen. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hid from thine eyes. So God is a God of the Amen. He's a God of faithfulness. He's a God of truth. And the Lord took that title, because he is the manifestation of the Father. And when he appealed to the Laodiceans, he was talking about faithfulness and truth, because that was lacking in the Ecclesia. 
Now, like all things, there's an interesting context. If you look, at, for example, at verse 12... Therefore will I number you to a sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that which I delighted not. So, so you see, God was calling. It's, it's, it's like the letter to the Laodiceans, I'm knocking on the door. I'm calling, but you're not responding. And there's a warning to the Ecclesia at Laodicea that they shouldn't follow that example. And verse 13, therefore thus saith the Lord Yahweh, behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, and ye shall be ashamed. And that's the very condition which the ecclesia was finding itself in. No truth, no certainty, no faithfulness. And there was this malaise, this wretchedness and miserableness and poverty and blindness. And that's the point of verse 13. The Lord didn't want the ecclesia to be in that situation. He wanted them to be faithful and true. So let's come back to Revelation chapter 2. Thus saith the Amen. And there's a solidity and truthfulness and power behind that expression. I am the Amen. I'm also, he said, the faithful and true witness. And, and, and that's a reference, isn't it, to the trial and the testimony that the Lord gave before Pilate. He was faithful and he was true. And, and a faithful and true witness is really a powerful witness. It's one who can be trusted. It's one who can be trusted never to misrepresent the truth, not to exaggerate it, not to suppress the truth, to give absolute veracity. And that's exactly what the Lord did on that trial. She stood before Pilate answered those questions, stood up for what was right. Art thou a king then? Yes, I am. My kingdom's not of this world. I've come, he said, to declare the truth. And Pilate walked away saying, well, what's truth? He was a faithful and true witness. You know, that expression, that title appears in Revelation 19. In Revelation chapter 19, he is coming back. And the faithful and true witness that, that, that gave that tremendous testimony of, and power of the word of God at his, at his crucifixion. In Revelation 19 and verse 11, I saw heaven open to behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So the witness now becomes the judge. <clears throat> and the witness of faithfulness and truth now becomes the judge of all the earth. And he is absolutely faithful and he's absolutely true. And those judgments will be absolutely right when he returns. So when we come back to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> we can determine the steadfastness of this son of God. Because that <coughs> was what precisely was missing in that ecclesia. And he says, I am the beginning of the creation of God. The word beginning there is that Greek word arche, which means the principal or chief part. He is the first of a long line of wonderful beings in Christ. The principal part. All of creation was focusing and funneling to the creation of this individual. The creation of this individual, the Son of God, raised from the dead and given immortality. Now come to Colossians chapter 1, because that's the language that the Laodiceans would have been extremely familiar with. Remember, this letter was a circular letter sent to Laodicea. And in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, we read this, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. It's a paradox, isn't it? How can you see something that's invisible? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, of every creation, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is an advance of all things, and for him all things were created. Everything converges on him. When the heavens and the earth were first made in Genesis chapter 1, God had in his, ma in his plan a purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring all things under the dominion of that individual. 
And now that's a reality. And he's standing here with Laodicea and he's saying to them, God is creating. You are his workmanship, he said to the Philippians, uh, to the Ephesians. He is molding and shaping and creating you. It's his work. And I want you to be part of that creation, Jesus is saying. It's based on truth, it's based on faithfulness, it's based on stability, it's based on the amen. But I want you to be part of this creation. I am the principal part, and you can become a part as well. And God does fashion, he does change, he does mould. But, but tragically, the Laodiceans had really neglected the power of that. So let's come back to Revelation chapter 2. I know thy works... Thou art neither hot nor cold. We find, in fact, that if we look at the geography of the region here, we have Laodicea, we have the Lycus Valley, which was very fertile, we have Hierapolis here, and we have Colossae over here. And uh, unfortunately, the water supply to Laodicea was very poor indeed, so they were dependent on piping water from nearby Hierapolis. The hot springs were were there. Um, there was also close by the refreshing springs of, of Colossae, and uh, by the time the water arrived from these two places, it was lukewarm. So it's, it's a, as an analogy there. It was emetic, that is, it, uh, it was vomiting-inducing water, nothing worse than, than actually having a water that's lukewarm, it really tastes disgusting. And so the very geography itself lends itself to the power of this. He said, I want you either to be hot or cold. Come to Proverbs 25. Cold. Well, this is what Proverbs 25 says. Verse 13. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. Snow in harvest rarely occurs. 35 degrees out there, 30 degrees out there, in your case, 22 degrees. <laughs> so the heat of harvest, you don't get snow. You might get a, a shower of rain, perhaps, but you don't get snow. So it is unusual, and that's the point of the proverb, that faithful messengers are unusual. Now, faithful, that's the word that Revelation 2 uses of Jesus Christ. I am the faithful witness. And that word messenger in the Septuagint is agalos, it's angel. So, so we have a direct reference to a faithful star angel. Isn't that interesting? And because of the uniqueness of snow in harvest time, tragically, faithful messages are few and far between. But the point of it is, is that that coldness, that, that, that snow is refreshing. And that's precisely the point that Lord Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 2. He said, he said I, I at least want you to be refreshing. I at least want you to be able to be refreshing but I can find no refreshment at all in your ecclesial arrangements, none whatsoever. And he said, I, if you can't be refreshing, then, then I want you to be hot. In actual fact, the word is zestos. We get our word zest from that. The root word of that zeo is used of, uh, of Apollos, who was fervent in spirit. That's what I want, fervency in spirit. That's what I'm seeking. <clears throat> refreshing or fervency. I, I don't mind which he said, but at least do something. At least do something. As this ecclesia was wallowing in this very awful indifference. And the Lord was very clear. Because thou art lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. It's a graphic figure, isn't it? Absolutely graphic figure. Indifference and apathy. Now, this is the danger, isn't it? Come to Zephaniah chapter 1. You know, here is an apathetic ecclesia in Zephaniah. Chapter 
Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Okay, Zephaniah. So here we are in the days of Josiah, most likely in the days when Jerusalem is about to be rocked by invasion. And the chapter goes through all of the different classes of people who are going to be affected by this invasion. And in verse 12, it can't, shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish them that are settled on their leaves. This is indifference. That say in their heart, Yahweh will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall be a booty, their house a desolation. They shall also build houses but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards but not drink the wine thereof. Total removal of all of the wealth that they trusted in. Settling on your leaves. It's a figure of a barrel of wine, if you like, a cask of wine. And the leaves come and settle at the top and they scoop those out. And here was, here was this ecclesia here, just, just uh, settling on the leaves. Blah. Nothing happening at all. And within their heart, they're saying, oh, Christ won't come. He won't do good. He won't do evil. We'll, we'll just continue life as it is. And you know, brothers and sisters, the tragedy of apathy and indifference is, is that no one wants to do anything. Love you to serve on this, uh, this committee, brother. Sorry, can't do it. A sister, love you to teach Sunday school. Sorry, can't do it. A brother, I'd like you to uh, stand for the platform appointment. No, sorry, can't do it. Sister, I'd like you to, to help with the, uh, with the catering arrangements or the family activities. No, not interested. That is a massive danger. Massive danger. The world itself has trouble filling posts for um, even... Uh, um, volunteers and, and civil duty to, to get people to do anything these days is difficult and it's also true in ecclesial life today committees end up collapsing because of lack of support arranging brethren's positions left vacant because no one's interested people can't get people to do things because not interested have other priorities and that is a massive danger how does the Lord react to that? Look at, look, at that, look at that picture there. A man gagging and vomiting. It's a graphic figure. Is the Lord indifferent to our indifference? No. Not at all. A huge warning, brothers and sisters. I want you to be zealous, hot. Here am I, send me. Yes, happy to serve. Love to do that job. Can't wait to help. That's, that's the attitude we need, brothers and sisters, across our ecclesial life. Those who give themselves, fervent in spirit like Apollos, hot or refreshing. Now that image of God vomiting, and it, it is a graphic image. I mean, out of, out of the mouth of God comes the sweet word of truth, but now vomiting. And it's used... In relation to the Canaanites, the sickening Canaanite society, immoral to the core. And God said, I'm going to spew them out of the land. And he warned Israel, he said, that if you continue in their practices, with their immorality and their indifference, I'm going to do exactly the same with you. The land will spew you out. That's how God feels about this, how the Lord Jesus Christ, the Amen, feels about apathy and indifference. And it's a plague. It's a plague. Difficult to get people to volunteer to do things which Paul styles the work of the Lord. You know, the, the things that we do in ecclesial life, the work of the Lord. It's not just any work. And that's why it's so disappointing to see apathy and indifference. Let's come back to Revelation and chapter 2. Because he said in verse 17, Thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. You know, 
th think about the response of the ecclesia. This is absolutely brazen. The ecclesia has no inhibitions, no embarrassment or restraint by putting up the hand and saying, I'm rich, I don't need a thing. You know, there's a brazenness about this, isn't there? There's almost a boasting about this. And that's frightening when you see that. It's based on Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's come back and have a look at this, shall we? Deuteronomy chapter 8. Because uh, the law warned about this kind of disposition. I am rich and have need of nothing. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, God warned them. You see, they just spent 40 years in a desert. And now they were to be brought into a land in complete contrast. They were going to step into vineyards and olive yards fully mature. They were going to step into houses which they didn't have to build. The infrastructure was all there. A massive contrast to go from this scarcity to this plenty. And God warned them. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and he said in verse 10, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless Yahweh thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not Yahweh thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. And thou forget Yahweh thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Verse 18, remember Yahweh thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which Yahweh thy God swore unto thy fathers this day. It hadn't even dawned on them at Laodicea that the wealth that they were enjoying was not their own. It was not their own. And instead of using that wealth for the benefit of the ecclesia, they simply amassed it and were happy just to stand back and to say, I don't need anything from you, God. Don't need anything. And that's, that is the awfulness of this Laodicean ecclesia. They didn't need God. I'm rich. Let's come to Zechariah chapter 11. Where did this come from? Well, it came from the shepherds of Israel. Zechariah chapter 11. I'm rich. In Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 4, we, we, we have a description of the shepherds. Thus saith Yahweh my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. I am going to destroy this flock. Why? Verse 5, whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty, and they that sell them that say, Blessed be Yahweh, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. So what was happening was, was the shepherds were fleecing the flock and saying, God's blessed me, I am rich. I am rich. That's exactly the cry of the Laodiceans. They were supposed to be elders leading the ecclesia, shepherding the ecclesia. And instead they were declaring their wealth to the world. And the record says, increased with goods. You know where that comes from? Come to Luke chapter 12. The Lord had spoken those words in a parable. Luke chapter 12. Verse 15. He said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And that theology cuts right across the world's concept, doesn't it? Wealth means everything to them. Wealth means power, influence, retirement, good times, pleasure. And therefore, the accumulation of wealth is a pursuit of the world. And the Lord says that a man's life doesn't consist of those things. There are more important things than bank balances, investments. We have to live, we have to make our way in the world, we're not saying we don't have to do that, but it doesn't become a basis for trust, a basis for absorption and priority. You speak a parable of them in verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? This will I do, I'll pull down my barns, build greater 
There will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods, laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure, but not for himself, but rich toward God. And there was the problem. There was no richness towards God. It was a man who had increased in good. <coughs> and, and, you know, that philosophy is our world. Growth. There has to be growth. 2% this year, 3% this year. Expand the business. Expand the warehouses. Expand the profitability. Bring in more shareholders. That is the pursuit of the world. And the Lord said that, uh, no, you need to be rich towards God. That there's nothing wrong with wealth per se. When you come to 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, this is the problem with wealth. Abraham was a very wealthy man. David was a very wealthy man. But here's the problem. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and certainly we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, those that want to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is a root of all evil, which some, having coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." It's called by Jesus Christ the deceitfulness of riches. Money has this alluring power. And the deceitfulness of the wealth is, is that it means that in the end you become self-satisfied, you don't need God, and you start to trust in that wealth. And that self-satisfaction was breeding constantly within Laodicea. People covered after it lotteries and things like that where they, they dream of being millionaires and, and it drives them. And Paul says that kind of behaviour creates traps, hurtful traps. So he, he warned them, but he also encouraged them. Verse 17, charge them that are wealthy in this, in this world, that they be not high-minded. You see, wealth can create this, this sense of superiority. Nor trust in uncertain riches, here today, gone tomorrow. But trust in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. There, there are other things than wealth. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to fellowship, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Uh, you know, and that's a little allusion to, to the foundations, the heaps of the foundations that were made in Old Testament times when, when some of the faithful priests asked for contributions to the temple. And the record says that, that all those contributions were heaped up as foundations. Be like that. Use the, what God has given you for the benefit of others. Open your home. Open your resources. Be rich towards God. And trust in the living God. Now, back in Revelation 2, that was missing. There was this self-declaration, this, this non-embarrassment. I don't need anything from God. What a state to be in. It's no wonder the Lord would spew them from his mouth. They believe that the wealth that they had received perhaps even came from God, was a blessing from God, and therefore were justified in keeping that wealth. But, but where was the sacrifice? Where was the generosity? Where was the commitment? And that self-satisfied, complacent indifference created this conceit. I am rich. Tragically, they had need of nothing, or so they thought. Now, the Lord is going to actually peel away this facade. But before he does, I want to just talk about this self-sufficiency. You know, we, we live in an age where young people are encouraged to get an education, get a good job, rise across the ranks. And, and that breeds a, an I can do attitude with the emphasis on the I can do. And I think it's an age which, in promoting 
self-sufficiency leaves us to face the danger that we don't need anything from God. And it's not until we go through life's trials and, and God deliberately <coughs> ensures that we have the right trial for the right person, that we understand the weakness of mortality, we understand the, 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 the weakness of our frame, uh, our failings as we go through life, uh, that in the end, brothers and sisters, we understand that we need God in all things. That wasn't happening in this ecclesia. It wasn't happening. I don't need anything from God. And that wealth had deceived them. We need to be very, very careful in the way we handle what God has given us. So he peels off the covers. And you can imagine the ecclesia <clears throat> sitting there, lovely dress this morning, wonderful clothes, Nice jewellery, plenty of money, settling on their lees. God won't do this, God won't do that, Christ won't do that. And so I may give an exhortation perhaps that Christ is coming. Yes, very interesting. Now, how is the stock market today? The Lord is really coming. Yes, but did that invoice get paid today? That was where the emphasis was. And when the Lord pulled off the covers, it was a miserable picture. And you can imagine the gasp within that audience that of this self-satisfied, wealthy group of people suddenly being exposed. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. It would have gone through, through, through the ecclesial meeting like a hot poker. Am I really like that? Am I really that wretched? It's the same word used that, that Paul used when he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Wretchedness. And they knew not. They'd been blinded by the deceitfulness of sin, the deceitfulness of riches. And that's what can happen to us as well. We're doing okay, thank you. Yeah, but not doing too bad. In fact, compared to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, I reckon I'm doing pretty well. And that self-sufficiency bred this pride. Now, they had been warned about the true wealth in the epistle to the Colossians. Let's come back to Colossians chapter 1. They had been warned of this. Both the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians talk about true wealth. And they had missed the point. So here it is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, in the preaching of the gospel, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where does true wealth lie? It's a glorious wealth, says Paul. But it lies in the manifestation of the qualities of Jesus Christ in us, which eventually will produce hope, which will eventually produce glory. That's true wealth. So the question we ask ourselves, the question I asked myself this morning, brethren and sisters, is, is, is Christ in us? It, are his words in us? Is his character in us? He was full of grace and truth. Is that how we come across to our brethren and sisters? Full of grace and truth? Does Christ live in our hearts by faith? That's true wealth. True wealth indeed. Chapter 2 and verse 1. He said, For I, I would that ye knew what great conflict or agony I have for you and for them at Laodicea. So here we are with Laodicea again. And Paul had a great agony of mind, disturbed by the pressures upon these ecclesias. And he sought in verse 2 that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There it is, agonizing over these ecclesias. And one of the issues was concerning wealth. And he wanted the ecclesia to understand where true wealth was. And the word of God is like a mine shaft of the jewels. The enormous wealth of wisdom is a treasure, but it's hidden, and it needs uncovering, and it needs work to do so. You're not going to pick up diamonds on the surface. You 
we've got to dig deeper. The riches of the full assurance of understanding. And that's why understanding and knowledge of the word of God is critical, isn't it, in developing Christ in us. Come across chapter 3. Let the word of Christ, in verse 16, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Or whatsoever you do in the word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. That is true wealth. Verse 24, knowing that the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. That's true wealth. True inheritance, true power. When we come back to Revelation chapter 2, it's disturbing that they had missed that. (coughs) I would hate for our Lord to describe me as wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked. (coughs) And I think that the ecclesia would have been shocked to learn that was the true state before the Lord Jesus Christ. The heart is deceitful above all things. When we examine ourselves, I don't think we do it honestly. Well, I I don't do it honestly. Getting that true, faithful understanding of our inner motives and our inner self is exceedingly difficult to do. We are very adept as humans of just pushing to the side those embarrassing things that we do and just ignoring those and maybe focusing on the things that we can do We're comfortable with those things, but we ignore our problems and our difficulties, our foibles and our bad habits. Wretched, poor, blind, miserable. And, of course, he adds the last one, naked. And we saw, didn't we, from yesterday, that that is the word picked up in Revelation 16 about our generation. Watch, Isardis. Don't be naked as Laodicea. And of all of the ecclesias the Lord could actually put together to describe our time, our challenges, our exhortation, it's those two ecclesias. We don't want to walk naked. So the Lord exposes our shame when he returns. Powerful exhortations, aren't they? So, is the Lord going to abandon that ecclesia? Well, he, well, he, he would be in all rights to do so, couldn't he? written them off, but, but he, w- he was now going to seek a solution for them. What, what solution would you offer to an ecclesia like that? What, what is the antidote to this self-sufficiency and this blasé indifference? Well, it starts off in verse 18 this way. I counsel. You know, the Lord could have said, I command. The Lord could have said, I insist, but he's offering counsel. You you can take it or leave it. Counsel. He is the wonderful counselor of Isaiah chapter 9. He is wisdom who offers counsel and advice. And it's exactly the same with the truth today. We can take it or leave it, brethren and sisters. But it's good counsel, isn't it? Excellent counsel. It's going to cost you something. Come to Isaiah 55. Buying. Well, buying is used in Isaiah 55. To indicate effort. They had to rouse themselves from their indifference and make an effort. So here it is in Isaiah 55 and verse 1. Ho, everyone, not just Jews, everyone, not just Sardis, Everyone, including Laodicea. Everyone that thirsteth, so we're talking about water. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. All your wealth, all your prestige. You don't actually need that, says Isaiah. You need water, you need food, but you don't need to buy it. So so, so what is the buying? Well, it's explained in verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which satisfieth not? 
Here's the cost. Hearken diligently to me. Eat that which is good. Let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Behold, I've given him for a witness to the people. That's the language of Laodicea. I'm a faithful and true witness, a leader and a commander of the people. So the effort, brethren and sisters, isn't going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time and diligence and commitment. That's the cost. Are we prepared to do that? We're going to leave this Bible school infused, hopefully, by the association that we have together, the power of the word of God discussed amongst us. And the question now comes, what are we going to do with that? Is it just going to be a, a faint week that we had in our life as go back to work and go back to our lives and, and the busyness of life takes over? We need to expend our energies in inclining our ear. Come to Christ and hear and our soul shall live. And even if we feel unworthy of that, in verse 6, seek ye Yahweh while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto Yahweh. Repent. That's the, that's the language of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Turn unto Yahweh and he will have mercy upon him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. That's our God. Gracious, merciful, willing to abundantly pardon if we turn to him with all our heart. It's never too late to do that, brethren and sisters. Never too late to do that. But that's the cost. Commitment and effort on our part. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 3. So he said, the first thing I want you to do is to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I want you to become like Smyrna, rich. I want you to be rich in faith, not, not wealth. And we know, don't we, that, that gold tried in the fire is a symbol of tried faith. Be hot. <laughs> be zealous. Be committed. Throw yourself back into ecclesial work. Throw yourself back into Bible study, Sunday school work, the education of your children, the family home. That's what I, I counsel. That's what beats indifference, a desire to be committed, to be hot. And uh, as Brother Thomas points out, actually, he, he says that if, if you actually have faith and, and you begin to express that faith in your words and your actions, that is going to actually bring a contention for the faith. And that in itself is going to be striving against sin. And that's going to re-engage the battle once more. And this sort of blasé indifference will disappear with that. Increase your faith. Strengthen your faith. Try your faith. And he said, I want you to take white raiment. Come back to Colossians again. The, the raiment was a significant figure. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 8, but now ye also put off. The garment of the flesh has been taken off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. That's what needs to be put back on. They're walking around spiritually naked. Anger, wrath, filthy communication was present. Lying one to another was present. Their wealth had, had deceived them. Well, the Lord says, I want you to put on, back on that garment. Put Jesus Christ back on. And the qualities that he has of holiness, bowels of mercy, verse 12, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. That's what I want to see in your ecclesia. I want you to reapply that, that garment. Now, of course, we know that in that region there were the, the, uh, the garments made of black wool. They knew all about garments. Put those qualities back on. That's a challenge, isn't it, to correct your behavior to that extent. 
We won't go to it, but it's based on Isaiah chapter 61, the garments of salvation and praise. That's what I want to see. And because the region was known for its I self, I want you to apply the word of God to your understanding. Get back to the scriptures, get back to the Bible, back to the readings. Challenge, isn't it? But that's the solution the Lord offered. Strengthen your faith and get that commitment back. Put on the qualities of goodness, holiness, righteousness and truth. And get your eyes back into the word of God. That's what we all need. I'm doing this, he said, out of love. It was the prerogative of God in old times, says Paul in Hebrews 12, for the father to chasten his sons. And that prerogative has now become the prerogative of Jesus Christ. Not only has he authority over all the angels, but he also has the authority now to direct trial, to direct problems, to chastise us out of love. He's been given that prerogative. And as many as I love, I will chasten. Uh, are we going through difficulties as an expression of the love of Jesus Christ? So he said, I want you to be zealous. I want you to be hot. The word zealio, we saw in our exhortation on Titus, be zealous of good works, same word. <laughs> Zeal, enthusiasm. That's what I'm looking for. And that's what needs to be part of our life. So, so as the Lord is standing there, you can hear in the background this constant knocking. And, and you know yourself that when you hear the knocking on the door, if it persists, you've got to answer that door. And the Lord is standing there at the door. And he's knocking. He's knocking, brethren and sisters. We're not going to turn to it this morning, but it's, it's based on the... Song of Solomon, chapter 5, where the, where, where the bride is opening the door and seeking the bridegroom. The bridegroom is there. It's the language of the parable of our Lord. That when there's a knocking on the door, he will open immediately. And that's the challenge that we have. That knocking is persistent. And the explanation is given in the next verse. If any man hear my voice, he's calling beyond that door. Based on Proverbs chapter 8, where, where wisdom calls through the door. And hearing his voice, of course, is the exhortation he gave in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. He's the example, brethren and sisters. He's calling, he's knocking, he's asking us to open the door of our hearts and allow him to dwell in there by faith. Are we up to the challenge? And if we can overcome, just as he overcame, he, he, he overcame by faith in the power and trust of his father's greatness. He set the example. He's leading the way. And he is offering us, brothers and sisters, a place in the kingdom on his throne to sit with him. What an incredible promise that is. Absolutely undeserved by any of us here today. None of us deserve this calling. We've traversed seven ecclesias, brethren and sisters. We've seen their highs and their lows. We've been encouraged. We've been confronted. We've been sustained by the presence of the Lord who in our midst knows our works. We're invited to incline our ear and hear. We're invited to listen to every lesson in all of those seven ecclesias. If we can overcome our individual problems, if we can overcome our ecclesial problems, if we can overcome by faith and love <coughs> the awful attractions of this world, the reward is absolutely stunning. To sit with him forevermore in that throne, to have that throne across the world, with us ruling the world in it. 